All right, now it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. What well, good start. Uh, welcome everybody to another Chaos OSPO working group meeting. Um, uh, let's just get right into it with practitioner guides. And is this uh, yours, Don? It is. Yes. Um, okay. Does somebody does somebody want to share the screen with the the minutes? I'm on a laptop and that would make it a whole lot easier. So I'm not trying to switch back between the faces or I could do it. That's easier. Sure. I have to pull them up on a second machine so I can't. I can do it. No, 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 no. I can do it. I can do it. Just give me, give me a sure. second. Sorry. No worries. Voila. Okay. Got it. Beautiful. Just move my screens around. Okay. Perfect. So yes, practitioner guides. So we have talked about these in the hospital working group uh, meetings quite a bit historically. Um, and you all know that we launched them, I hope, because we did that uh, at the very end of April. And what I wanted to point out was that uh, when we launched them, we did not have a way for you to provide feedback on the guides. So what we've added is a feedback form to the bottom of each of the guides. The feedback form is the same on all, all four guides. But I would encourage you, if you've already had a look at the guides or if you've used them for anything and want to provide feedback, yeah. um, I'd really appreciate it if you could send us some feedback because I am really curious how people, in particular people within hospitals, are using the guides so that we can, we can use data to make them better or possibly do some other things around them, maybe some complementary resources that might find sense. So we'll... Uh, yeah. Uh, anybody have any questions in general about the practitioner guides? Okay. Cool. All right. I assume this next one's also you. Done. <laughs> it is also me. Um, so in this meeting a while back, we came up with a list of well, we came up with a couple of ideas about projects that we might be able to do within the chaos project. With the idea being that we have whole data science community within the chaos project. And they are, in a lot of cases, eagerly looking for um, interesting data challenges to work on. So we came up with a couple of ideas, and then it, it got kind of stalled because our ideas within this group were, they were really big. Like, you know, we need to um, do a whole bunch of analysis of elephant factor, which is uh, a little bit broad. So. We were trying to break those down into projects and then define them in a lot of details and it got kind of stalled because there's just a lot to do so what i did um so this is this is the doc that it, it started with and it was it was just a, you know as you can see here it's kind of kind of a lot of a lot of stuff so what i did was i took that doc and i did this with it i created individual projects that we could get data science people working on. So even though these are data science projects, I'm actually bringing them here into this working group, to the OSPO working group first, because I was curious if you had any other thoughts about the projects. Like, are they defined in particular, like Sophia, I know you were working on some of these. I know Chan, you're working on event location inclusivity. And I was curious if these uh, the way that these projects are defined kind of makes logical sense. And then I was also curious from this group, from the OSPO folks, if there are any that we want to prioritize higher than, than any others. Um, so those are kind of the two asks that I have for this group before I take this back to the data science group is, are these the right sets of projects? Um, if there are more things, we have um, an issue template so you can actually create a new data science projects proposal. So if these, if you think we're missing something big that you would love to see people work on, feel free to do a new project proposal as well. And then uh, before I turn it over for feedback, the one thing I will mention is that I have actually been working a little bit on the, the license change project in that I've been building basically a data set that has a list of um, has a list of license changes for projects. So we've got a list of, I guess it's 19 projects so far. Um, so this one is maybe a little bit further along than some of the other projects. 
Um, with that, I will I will stop talking for a minute and see what you all think. So I, I don't know how to raise my hand on Zoom anymore. So I'm just going to talk. <laughs> um, are these aimed at, like, for example, if you click on like license change? Right, yeah. Like trying to understand how data might be used to understand when a licensing change is coming for a project? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's really can we predict the likelihood of a license change based Are, on based on data? Based on some activity within the community or some whatever that thing yeah, might be. Or or other data. I mean I, I don't know. I mean the data set that I put together is literally just the the repos and the license change. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of other data that we could pull in uh, with the idea that I mean that's not a data set, right? Get you started data set. So we would build real data sets to, to analyze um, out of that. Okay. Um, and are all of them, if you go back to the list, I don't, I know the document you were talking about that got created a while ago. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The black, and, are a lot of these meant to be kind of predictive? We're talking about story and I could just tell the the so like, Maybe not so much, like event location inclusivity, that doesn't seem to be predictive. No, that one is the, the the bottom two are a little bit different. Um, I think that these these three are kind of they're they're under the elephant factor umbrella issue, and I think they're all sort of designed to be more predictive. So, <laughs> like if you look at, for example, classification, this one's a little bit more broad and still really needs some definition. But this is, you know, kind of like Remy, what your team and Microsoft have been doing. Could we could we build on that and have other types of classifications? So I know this is something that Sophia has yeah. talked a lot about in the past, but yeah, how do you even yeah. define a project? Like how do you tell whether a repo is, you know, one of ten repos is part of a project or whether that repo is is a project in and of itself? And how do we classify other things? Other than just you know people people knowing things about them. So this is a project that oops, still needs a bit of a bit of definition. Uh, Remy. Yeah, um, <laughs> one of the things that we've been talking about since we released the Nadia labels classification with Microsoft at Open Source Summit North America was that different size oh. organizations no, I... might have different thresholds for uh, what constitutes a, a large community or a small community or a lot of users. So we've been throwing around the idea of having like, um, you know, to use, um, and I don't do this often, but to use like a sports analogy, like there's division one, division two and division three uh, NCAA schools, right? Which are like classified by their population size. So like you can talk about you know, for a division one or a triple A or a, you know, double A or an A uh, level organization, like what is large or small, um, you know, comparing like Kubernetes to, uh, you know, your toy project over here, like they're just they're not that many galactic level open source communities out there. So I think there is a, a classification taxonomy quite, uh, conversation to still be had even beyond that. But uh, for folks, we'll we'll link to the uh, to the naughty label stuff in Augur uh, for those who maybe not heard of it. Yeah, and I did I did link to your talk um, from Open Source Summit because I thought that was really relevant. But the other piece of this is how how much classification can we derive just from the data? I don't know, Sophia, if you want to talk a little bit more about this. I think this idea for project kind of came out of some of your. I mean, it's, it's also like, there's sort of the comment of what kind of classification do you need to, to help with whatever type of analysis you're working on. I know, I think if I remember correctly, this project came up because we were trying to make sure that we were counting all the appropriate repositories in context of a project. Um, and the confusion came for a lot of satellite libraries and packages people were building that are say affiliated with something like or Python. I mean, languages are particularly porous, um, but 
some of them officially became supported by the core maintainer group and others didn't because they were sort of like little side projects made by individuals. Um, and so within some projects, I think Go is a good example here, they've done a little bit more conventional naming to demonstrate when these sort of affiliate projects are affiliated with the central project. And so now a lot of them have been renamed Go dash thing whatever it is. And then, so even though they're not under the Golang organization on GitHub, their naming is still complying with this, the same sort of standard structure so that these things are identified as Golang affiliated projects um, and say part of the broader Golang ecosystem. Um, but that that was a somewhat recent change. It wasn't like that a couple of years ago, uh, if you were looking at the data. Um, and so I th think that that's one example where we've seen the broader sort of ecosystem get organized on naming to make things easier to find, but it's not always that simple. Um, and when things are growing organically, it's it's harder to make those calls and distinctions. So um, it's just whether or not if there's a, a way to do this at scale is really hard um, without any sort of standard naming um, or approach that is either defined by project or by ecosystem. Um, but yeah, I don't know how many people actually have this problem. I know I've kind of suffered through it manually many times, uh, depending on the scope of the analysis that we're working on. So I think there, there's some, like that. that's sort of the, what is your project boundary question? But I've also been working on other classifications on just the nature of the project and looking at software ontology, but that is a whole nother can of worms that I think it's would probably blow up, blow up the scope of this and I don't wanna mention it here. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, so let me let me ask: Are there are there any of these projects that we think are um, more important that we want to maybe encourage people from the data science group to tackle first? Okay. If not. We don't, we don't have to. I mean, I, I kind of the license change one just because I've been, been working on the data set for that. Um, not, I think not that so one much, might be interesting. Not so much a prioritization thing, but I, I noticed that Sophia posted a um, article the other week uh, regarding sudden archival. Uh, I remember it because it had a very funny name. It was, uh, we're all just kind of winging it. So that might be good to at least have a touch of that ticket. I'm going to, if you don't mind accepting a comment there. Oh, please Co comment at will. So I would say anybody on this call, if you have ideas for any of these projects, even if, you know, even if you don't want to work on it, but if you have ideas for the direction, if you have additional resources, the people who work on this might, um, might want to see, I would say, please, please leave comments on any of these. Uh, Remy. This is more on the front end than on the back end side, but what we're hoping with our next batch of coding it forward fellows who are coming in for the summer is uh, we want to align them with, with like an Augur API endpoint and then have them come up with front end visualizations as well. So we're hoping to do a lot of like, here's a data point, like what's a good way to display this in a report? Um, so that's maybe not a data science back end question, but more of a front end one. Um, we got like elephant factor and programming language and a few others that are uh, identified for our backlog for the summertime. But we'll, we'll definitely keep you folks updated as we plot plot and scheme a little bit more detailed. Yeah, I love that idea. And you know, if, if any of them want feedback, feel free to point them towards the data science working group as well. We'd be happy to we'd be happy to have them as part of the part of the community. When did how often does that group meet? It meets every other every other week, so it's um, on the week's opposite of OSPO, but at a different time. Perfect. I will day. add that to the backlog of things that we will add to the intern duties when they get here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, uh, Gary. Also, just plugging the um, Augur working group uh, because I know that we have uh, the Eight Knot project that's visualizing a lot of stuff from Augur, so that might give a leg up on getting those visualizations actually active, if that's something cool. you can use.
So would okay. Ray, what you were proposing, could that be an issue here, Don? Because I mean, th I think part of what, it seems like some of these issues are trying to build a group of people around a topic. And so we do in chaos have a lot of newcomers and folks that are looking for different ways to participate. So maybe would that make sense here, Don, to open an issue around what Remy described front end stuff or not really? I would say I would say I would leave that up to Remy because if um, it sounds like they're doing it as part of kind of a formal internship program. Okay. So it might not make sense to just like open it up for anybody. Um, I would say I would leave that up to Remy if there are pieces of it that you want some help with or you want to create a project around. Um, I would say, please, you know, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I think we're going to file them at first as tickets on our repo, on our metrics repo. But whenever we can, we want to be shipping this kind of stuff upstream. So, you know, they might end up as upstream auger tickets. They could end up in the chaos tracker here now that I see this thing here. So we'll figure it out as a team. Um, but, you know wherever we can get community input and work with the upstream community that is a better experience for our interns anyway so yeah let's yeah, uh, sure. try yeah, to figure let us know out if we can get, help get everybody together awesome cool uh okay so i think i i think i covered everything on the data science projects that i wanted to cover okay so now now i'm done none of the other agenda i all right. Uh, discussion questions about S bombs. Let's dive into it. Oh yeah, I can lead it here. I'd like to also just introduce a colleague and friend, Andrea Grover, who's here today. So Andrea is bringing this call and has done open source stuff in the past, and I just like to take an opportunity to introduce her. So introduce Hi, her. Andrea, welcome. Nice to have Andrea here. Um, so okay, so coming from Open Source Summit. North America, there was just a little bit of conversation around S bombs <laughs> and the the kind of the requirements around them, um, particularly as the federal government seems to be asking for them <laughs> more uh, more diligently now, which seems to be having cascading effects throughout the open source world, because <laughs> because. Um, so I found it really interesting because S bombs, you know, like with SPDX stuff, have been around for a long time, um, a long time. I mean, SPDX is one of the, I think, one of the first, you know, 15, 20 projects at the Linux Foundation. So it's it's been talked about for a long time. Yes, the CISA stuff. So, um, it, and it seems like it had always people had always been kind of interested in s bombs and i think the reaction to them was like yeah that makes sense <laughs> like it's a good idea if we do them but maybe there wasn't enough pressure on the system to actually require them and i feel like there's starting to be um kind of a ramp up on that pressure um and recently i attended remy i think you were there too on that that monday meeting the there's the it's the I don't know what the working group is titled, but it's an open community meeting where there are a lot of representatives from a lot of different organizations talking about S bombs. Um, maybe you've been to it more than I have, Remy. Maybe more meaning more than once. <laughs> so, um, uh, sauce. I don't know the name of it. I was invited by Ria from HPE to it. So maybe that's the one. It was like Monday at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock my time. So I, I guess a couple of questions here. I'm, I'm curious for people on this group, you, do you feel like your work right now is being impacted, you know, by policies requiring S bombs? Are you starting to feel some additional pressure or anything in that regard? Yeah, Gary. It wouldn't be a meeting with Gary if he didn't mention viability. Um, as we're pursuing getting viability like in our software stack and thinking about it strategically, uh, along with vulnerabilities and licensing, we use tools specifically to get SBOMs um, because we kind of have to, both as a federal requirement and because we need that data to understand what our OSS dependencies look like. And, uh, you know, community health metrics play and dovetail nicely into that data when you have it. But uh, it's almost like SBOMs are the data source here uh, that are important for 
pursuing community health metrics because otherwise you don't know what packages are getting used the most. Uh, you don't know which ones might be the most out of date or the weakest communities or what have you. So like it's definitely been impacted because I've had to collect them, but it's also made my work a little bit easier because the work that I need to do as part of an OSPO is like pushed ahead by having S bombs available. Okay, I see. So are you, Gary at Verizon, are you asking your vendors to provide them? And if they don't provide them, are you creating them yourself? Um, yeah, vendors generally provide S bombs now without uh, having to ask for them. Uh, you can, but almost all the time as part of like negotiating Okay. You, you get a list of software that comes with it. Okay. Are they any good? The yes, S-bombs? <laughs> no assertions, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, it varies. Uh, I think depending on what tool they use, how much effort was put into it, right? Uh, without naming names, you do get some vendors that just... Not asking, yeah. Don't give you everything. Okay. So there's secondary scanning. It, well, it, then it's good to have this stuff in place, right? Because you get the build and you can scan it and see what's actually in it. Okay. Um, other, I'm curious if other people are kind of seeing ch changes. That first question is being impacted by S bombs. Remy, I'm guessing you do, in kind of a different kind, different different form. More so for inbound. So you know. This, a lot of the, um, here's a link to a bunch of PDFs, uh, the memorandums that came out of the White House, M-2218, and then amended by uh, 22, 2316, talks a lot about, you know, if you're going to be procuring federal software, the vendors need to attest to certain things and they need to provide S-bombs for stuff. So it's less so on the outbound side for us and more so on the inbound side, but that's like, I'm part of the federal government now. So, you know, that makes sense. Um, but uh, that stuff is there. I think an interesting uh, development that's sort of not directly in my wheelhouse, but like nearby, because uh, the FDA has just put out some SBOM guidelines as well for not just the software bill of materials, but also like their hardware bill of materials and stuff like that. And like, uh, there's some uh, gaps between providing like end of life information around your S bomb. So like how long it's going to be supported and when you're going to like force people to uh, end of life and end of support for your projects, which is not an SPDX thing. So there's a little bit of a gap between what the policy says and what the standards look like right now in that space. So that's a new development that I think is interesting that I just found out about like yesterday. Wait, they're um, asking but, like upstream vendors to indicate like what they think end of life might be on this particular yeah. pack. That's interesting. I feel like that's a, like I'm not an expert in the Europe side of things either, but I feel like some of the, the European standards are starting to ask for that too, where they're like, can you guarantee that this is gonna be wow. maintained for five years or 10 years or something like that? Um, and asking for some of the assurance attestation type stuff for using national level software. Um, a, it seems like a trend. I'm uh, relative yeah, yeah. new to the space, so I'm keeping an eye on it. That's that's interesting. You're right, that's not in SPDX, as far as I know, any sort of attestation like that. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, any other thoughts on that first question? Um, can I go to this? I'll go to the second one. <laughs> Opportunities, Gary, you mentioned one, I think being able to like track down the communities that you might care about by taking a look at the SBOM itself. One of the challenges, and Remy, I don't know how much you were on the call on Monday, but um, that came up was that, that SBOMs can provide a threat vector by actually, um, by actually exposing everything that is being used in the software in the upstream, providing a whole long detailed list of uh, possible points of attack. I'm curious, I thought that was really interesting. I was not expecting that response. Um, I don't think that way. But um, are, there, are there 
other opportunities or, or like problems that people see kind of from this? Not not the thing I just mentioned, but just having S bombs integrated into your workflow, or that you've had to overcome. Like I can't, it's I can't imagine it's ever just smooth to say we're going to include this whole new thing <laughs> in our workflow, <laughs> and you're all like, "Yes, this is awesome, <laughs> thank you," and it just goes really s smoothly. So I'm I'm just kind of wondering what those, if any problems have arisen in that regard. Or not. Yeah, Remy. I will, I will keep saying this one out loud when I get a chance. And it's that even if we have a perfect list of all the out-of-date dependencies and all of the CVEs and KEV, there are still not enough maintainers to close them all and fix them all. So we need to continue educating and supporting the open source maintainer community so that we can actually take these to-do lists and work through them. Uh, I think that we get stuck on making the to-do list a lot more than we figure out who is going to be working on the to-do list. So I just want to say that out loud as a potential here, issue. <laughs> here are all the things that need to be done. Now, <laughs> Y'all, whoever you might be, go do it, <laughs> even though we don't know who's out there. <laughs> I gotcha. Um, one of the other things that I was kind of thinking about was, you know, within a supply chain, within a software supply chain, is there, like, not just a, at a single company level, but at, in a supply chain, is like, is there a point where um, communities don't really care to produce S bombs? So like the federal government requires them on the inbound and then perhaps like a large vendor to the federal government is like, yeah, we're definitely going to do that because that's an important contract for us. And then a company like whomever Microsoft would say to their vendors, okay, we want you to provide these as well. And then the vendors vendors, see what I'm saying? Like there, there has to be a point where this breaks down where a small, we talked about these small projects way in the upstream are like, forget it. I'm not doing that extra work. <laughs> and so there just has to be this workload that I would imagine has to get distributed somewhere. And I'm not sure where, it seems like it's going to have to reside somewhere. I'm not sure where that's, that's going to be. So maybe the more of a comment than anything else. Um, okay, cool. Um, was there a last question I had on there? Oh, are, are any of you participating in the federal in any um, any of the any federal working groups like the one I went to on Monday I'm just trying to keep an eye out for other things that other groups that might be talking about this kind of stuff as far as how to deploy <laughs> these things <laughs> sure fair enough. <laughs> Point well taken, or how about this? Any, <laughs> yeah, um, any other working groups that you you feel this is being talked about in, you know, anywhere? Is to do group talking about this stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I was just actually I was just going to suggest actually maybe posting this question in the to do group Slack channel. Okay. Um, to see, especially you know the the other working groups because some of those folks would definitely would definitely know. And I feel like this meeting is a little bit lightly attended from the, the corporate OSPO side. Uh, okay. So some of those folks who aren't in the meeting today might have some ideas. Okay, uh, that'd be great. Okay, I did actually post this in, in one of the to-do group channels and there were some responses like Gil Yehuda had provided a response there. So there were some other folks that had provided some really interesting responses and I can, grab that link um, as well. So um, yeah, Divya. Um, so actually, funny story, I was talking to um, one of the um, folks working with OpenSSF. Actually, he's, I, 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 I don't know the relation actually, but he, he also works for the Linux Foundation, but is a contract employee. I don't know how that works out. Not getting to the specifics, but he's Ram Iyengar. He's a DevRel with um, 
uh, open SSF. And one of the things that um, they are looking out at the open SSF um, level is to actually, uh, maybe not directly related to SBOMs, but um, also like uh, improve their outreach and improve their uh, um, whole uh, community building process around this. I know it's not directly related to this, but this is something that they were very keen on improving, not just at uh, the uh, local level uh, in Asia, but also globally, because uh, they feel like the source and the open SSF days that they normally conduct do not provide enough of outreach uh, to the target audience that they normally uh, intended to get to. So um, to your point, I think they might be interested uh, and maybe, you know, cross-posting it about cross-posting your question there would probably help. Okay, no, that's great. I appreciate that. Thanks, Divya. That's a good pointer. All right, thanks, everybody. This is These seem still pretty early. <laughs> Maybe I'm behind the times, but it seems like there still seems to be a lot sorted out here. Um, and I am curious, I think maybe to Gary's first point is how these can be related to the work that we're doing in chaos. Just because this is a whole, it's a whole thing that's being rolled out across an ecosystem and it seems to have some relationship. So thanks. All right, Davio, you have the floor. Okay, I'll be very quick because I'll ramble. So I'm going to be very quick. Um, uh, so essentially, um, uh, Hiro Fukuchi and uh, Masayuki Kowata, both of them are uh, OSPO um, as well as Open Chain members. And I know that uh, for the blog post that I read before joining Chaos and before, you know, actually joining Chaos Calls, um, that standardization was one of the metrics. Matt even posted about that. So they were very interested in actually joining uh, these calls, but it's very late for them. It's actually pretty late for me too. It's night. 10 p.m. right now uh, so it's probably 1 a.m. for them so they probably would not be able to join these calls and additionally um, one of the things that uh, uh, the uh, uh, group members told me is that they have restrictive policies around uh, joining calls that are recorded um, and have like you know, these recordings posted on YouTube. So they told me that normally in the OSPO and open chain side of things, they have this uh, call that is uh, governed by Chatham House rules. And uh, it's something they were looking to explore if it's possible in our space. Um, and uh, I actually reached out to Elizabeth before, um, uh, you know, fielding this question here uh, so that it seemed like a normal uh, I mean, I just wanted to understand if it was a normal ask. Uh, so this is this this was a thing that they put forth whether they could actually have like a um, discussion. They uh, are governed by Chatham House rules, and then you know me act as the me acting as the bridge to actually come and update the call. But I don't know how that would work because they've never participated in this call before. And I don't know how a sync communication with them with would work with them as well because again, they've just started working with us. So this is just to say that this is probably one of the options. But I'm very curious about how, or uh, you know, if we could explore other options and how we could facilitate our interaction with them. So yeah, I'm gonna pause there for a bit and see if there are any questions. Well, thank you for this, um, Divya. Uh, so I've been trying to connect with the JDF, the Joint Development Foundation, to work towards ISO standards on some of the metric models. And it might be a great place to start because we have quite a few of them. And one of the first thoughts was to um, was to start with just a few of the metric models that could be good candidates for going through the standardization process because I've never done that and I think it's a little bit of a pain like I think there's a bunch of rules <laughs> that need to be followed yeah. I don't know what those rules are and so um, Jory at the JDF was going to kind of help with those rules and maybe to your point then we could first focus on a couple of the metric models that would be useful in the in the corporate OSPO space you know what I mean? As candidates to, to go through, and that could perhaps 
um, be supportive of the stuff that is going on in Japan, uh, particularly around the work that OpenChain is doing. So uh, maybe you and I should talk and this could come together. And then async seems to be okay with me. We could try it that way. Um, I'm not sure how to coordinate the work. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they're not able to join. So this actually was conveyed to me after we had the conversation at Open Source Summit NA where I stopped by the booth that, uh, you know, they would not be able to join any of our calls if they're recorded and posted on YouTube uh, because the typical way that they have calls in uh, both the to-do space as well as the open chain space is uh, governed by Chandra Mahal's rules where they don't uh, right. post on YouTube at all. Like, at least the ones that... Uh, the Japanese folks are involved in. I don't know about the rest of the, um, you know, working groups. At least specific to their chapters, um, they they were never. And I even actually checked for the China ones. I think they are governed by similar rules as well. Okay. Yeah, all of the to do group general meetings are um, Chatham House rules because okay. the the invite list are people who are to do group members. So those those meetings are not intended for the general public they're intended for for to do group members and the discussions are all under chatham house rules but i don't i don't see why we couldn't do something maybe we do something special where we have you know a, a monthly chaos meeting that's under chatham house rules that people can participate in and do it at a time that's pretty early for the folks in u.s central that would work better for the folks in japan yeah i I wouldn't mind. I mean, it would be early for me too. Like, uh, not early, early, but like attendable early. So, plus one to that. Yeah, I like that idea. And Remy said plus one to that too. So maybe that's a good thing to to go forward with. That we could host a like a monthly meeting to start this conversation. Yep. Okay. That seems easy enough. Um, okay. Great. Divya, I'll connect with you on Slack too. And we can kind of sort out the details. Right on. Elizabeth, were you going to say something? You unmuted and turned your camera off. <laughs> I, <was, laughs> I was just going to say that I'm happy to coordinate whatever you all need on the calendar. If you trust me with the calendar, which I don't, it's so, questionable. So. <laughs> but yes, I'm here to support you, whatever you need. Just let okay. me know. Thank you. All right. I think you're on mute, Gary. Are you talking? Yep, I sure was, and I <laughs> sure was on mute. I'm ready um, to say, Gary, go right ahead. <laughs> it's it's happened. I did it. Um, did a podcast about viability and the work Gary's been doing at Verizon. Uh, once again, it would not be a meeting with me if I didn't mention viability. What are you going to What are you going to do when these are all published and like? like no more podcasts and stuff like that i don't know probably nothing <laughs> um but yeah I, I didn't post this but uh check it out it's pretty it good was, it was a good podcast uh and then ospos for good symposium at unhq in new york yeah i added that one to the agenda i figured i'd just put it on everyone's radar in case it wasn't already um it happened last year was the first one. They're doing their second one. Um, there's a self-registration link, I believe, linked to on that there. So you can go and check that out. Um, I believe it's still open. Um, there's the 9th and 10th are the main days. And then I hear there's a workshop day on the 11th, which is going to be at Microsoft, I think. So um, if folks are interested, that's the program committee. You'll recognize some familiar faces there. Um, just want to make sure it was on everybody's radar. Since this is the OSPO metrics group, I figured an OSPO symposium might be of interest to the crowd. Yeah, Absolutely. it looks like it looks like Georg is going to help organize that metrics workshop on the 11th. So if anybody's interested in helping Georg with that, it might be worth reaching reaching out to him. But yeah, I've had some discussions with Jacob around this, and he's got a lot of really really interesting people lined up for these 
uh, for this event. So I think it's, I can't go personally, but I think it's going to be a good one. Um, just a quick comment, I was meeting with Jacob Blake today about this event. Um, um, the registration might be closed, but I think the, the third day of events happening at Microsoft is not the same invite list, as in I think you can potentially show up to that separately. So I just want to say if you couldn't get into the main workshop, but you're in New York anyway, I think you could still go to those. Um, I'm not exactly sure how you would register for them separately, but I, I do know that as a separate like attendee and occupant, like how, how are the managing attendance to that is separate. <clears throat> Cool. All right. Uh, thanks, Remy, for posting that. I'm sure folks will uh, try to attend, uh, try to make it if they if they can. And that brings us to the end of our agenda. Is there anything else folks want to bring up, chat about while we have everybody here? Going once. Going twice. Okay, that's it. That is the end of this instance of the OSPO metrics working group. Uh, thanks everybody for participating. Thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate you and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.